Uh, Simon is the director of the MFA in curating. Uh, he's been curating and writing and theorizing for a long time um, and has, I think, form the former West is one of your substantial public... <laughs> like, it's a huge, huge book uh, looking at um, kind of post-globalization scenario, I think. So kind of relevant to some of what Patricia was talking about last week and has recently put together a book on urban... Urban practice. Urban practice, urban practice. So still busy, uh, as well as through, uh, in writing, as well as through teaching. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand over to Simon for the rest okay. of the talk. So I can buy, uh, yeah, yeah. Add uh, a YouTube clip. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Uh, Yeah, Suhe was saying I'm just a stand-in stand -in date for tonight, I didn't uh, say that. which is uh, uh, good because um, I always say that one should never apologize for one's work, um, but I do have some caveats that I um, wasn't planning on doing this talk, so it's going to be uh, where the others were uh, well-prepared and heavy on theory, mine is going to be underprepared and light on theory, um, and where they tended to go uh, in the direction of being too long, mine will probably go in the direction of being too short but hopefully it will still uh, give us something to talk about and uh, round out uh, the series a little bit. And I will present some of the things that I'm working on currently, um, only partly published, uh, which is because I'm writing a book on apocalypse, <laughs> the cheery subject of apocalypse, um, but it's cultural meanings, cultural and political meanings, and um, so not necessarily uh, within a kind of uh, Christian trajectory. Earth, I think this is an enormous mystery. I really don't think anybody has the faintest idea how that works. In Greenland. I found life in the oldest rocks on Earth. All these rocks have some story to tell. It can be very good to come here from Sweden, as an art, because we have established this symbiotic relationship with oil. I'm sorry, we messed your environment up. Well, no, no, I'm not going to say that I'm not going to say that. The sun's lifetime is halfway through now. It's gonna start uh, heating up Earth, but for now. And then there's going to be a cold rock left. Okay, so that, that was a trailer from a film um, by the Greenlandic filmmaker Ivalo Frank, uh, which is a film that uh, just premiered this year. Um, I don't know if it's uh, showing up in any festivals here. I saw it in a film festival. Um, I wasn't able to find uh, longer clips from it. Um, but it's uh, uh, an interesting film because uh, she was trying to make a film about climate change and the possibility of the disappearance of the human species that was not depressing, uh, which I think is a, a, a quite a task. And, and um, one, of course, of the, the, the points of the film is that to actually discuss what constitutes life, both its beginning, its end, and possible afterlives, uh, is, is maybe something that... Um, or it's not, maybe, but it's surely something we can think outside of the human uh, organism. Uh, so, also because the, the uh, earliest forms of life has been discovered by a geologist in, in Greenland, and they're uh, millions of uh, years earlier than we thought, actually. So, uh, the film, in a way, portrays this uh, uh, notion that the future is finite um, for our species, maybe even for our planet. Uh, but uh, that at the same time as, uh, so it, it sort of juxtaposes these images of uh, 
um, an, a, a, a sort of natural landscape, if you will, uh, which is quite spectacular, uh, but it's also changing rapidly so, um, because of the ice melting. So in a place like uh, Greenland, indeed, all across the Arctic region, you can see the slow violence of climate change the fastest. Right? It's where it's at its highest velocity. Uh, you can see it every, every basically year by year. Um, um, so it juxtaposes that with um, actually a, a number of interviews with uh, children and teenagers about their notions of not just the future but actually of the present and what companionship means to them. And I think uh, that's sort of inspired by one of the things that, that um, I'll return to later, which is the idea of how uh, to live among the ruins uh, if w uh, what we are in is a sort of state of ruination, and that's uh, taken from Anna Singh's uh, work, and I'll return to that uh, uh, in a little bit. Uh, I want to just to start with uh, um, just a few words about the planetary, and then this uh, uh, notion of the current kind of malaise crisis that we're in, in terms of, I would say, ideology uh, and thinking about the future, uh, and then uh, make some remarks about why we do not need to think of ruination uh, necessarily as destruction, um, but perhaps also as new beginnings uh, and beauty, and indeed as a condition of brokenness to embody uh, and to um, negotiate. Uh, so um, I think that, that in, in terms of what the, the kind of planetary scale and how it, how it so has can or should try and change uh, in our imagination and therefore also in our politics uh, the notion of the global and globalization into something else uh, has to do with scale, as I think Patricia Reed uh, pointed out very well with her reference to uh, Zachary Horton's book, The Cosmic Zoom, that came out in 2021, which is uh, basically a book about scale but scale uh, not as a kind of strange, uh, let's say, double-edged uh, analytical term. Um, scale being different from size, that scale is not about small or large, about big data or uh, nanoseconds, but rather about how we measure and uh, portray size. So um, he claims in the book that we now have a, a, a different notion of uh, scale that is what he calls the cosmic zoom. And by that he means that we, uh, as I said in the introduction to Mao's talk, uh, have gotten used to thinking about uh, uh, the planet from the outside and as a whole. And that we imagine that scale at the same time as we can go into the smallest microbes and imagine those scales. So on the, on the one hand, scale is uh, an ideological instrument of measurement. You know, what is it that we scale? How do we scale up? How do we scale down? And, and any kind of scaling has uh, drastic consequences onto matter, uh, physical as well as mental. At the same time, we are now witnessing a notion of scale in terms of size, the cosmic, but also in terms of temporality that uh, completely supersedes uh, if you will, kind of human perception uh, and uh, human history, uh, what's also known as a, as a kind of a, a planetary rethinking of, of uh, what history means. So, uh, and he says in the book, which I thought was, was, was interesting in thinking of the ruination, that uh, this is, the cosmic zoom is not a book about ruination at all, but it does bring up the notion of the ruin uh, when he, actually defines the cosmic zoom in uh, a single line, uh, which is at, at, at the conclusion uh, of, the, of the sort of opening gambit, uh, the first chapter of the book, which is where uh, Horton says, the cosmic zoom is, in one sense, a way to shore up the fragments of the human against our ruins, and then he puts in parenthesis, scalar ruins. So the scales we use are in ruins, and the worlds that we look at uh, are in ruins. Uh, so, the, 
ruination is of course uh, uh, not a, a, a new term in, in aesthetics. Um, in the Romantic tradition, particularly in the UK, uh, you will notice um, throughout the 18th and 19th century uh, as, as uh, young ma men, artists and uh, archaeologists did the grand tour of Europe and traveled to Greece, also to Egypt and to Italy and uh, looked at ruins, uh, ruins of antiquity and the Renaissance uh, and of ancient Egypt, excavated them, brought back lots of stuff as well. Um, but uh, uh, in, in, in looking at those ruins, the ruins themselves uh, became something else than simply um, objects to be reimagined and restored. So they, they, they weren't just something that you could aspire to and say we need uh, you know, classicist architecture, which is of course what they would then build uh, uh, in, in, in Northern Europe uh, at that time. But they started to see them, particularly through painting, as aesthetic objects in themselves. So not as what they represented in terms of lost history, but almost in a kind of sculptural way. And of course, the way that they were blended in with the landscape. And indeed, of course, uh, uh, you can say that what ruins, those kind of ruins are, uh, they are an archive of the human imprint on the world, as much as they are about specific cultures and their aspirations. So, of course, even when we imagine, you know, as this uh, um, uh, film, uh, or this short trailer I showed you kind of hinted at, even if we imagine at some point, or we don't have to just imagine it, we know that at some point our species won't be here, and maybe that will be sooner rather than later, again in a temporality that we can't really grasp, uh, that our legacy will still be left behind in terms of the ruins of all the changes we made, the ruination we made to the environment, but also, if you imagine, uh, uh, the, the scale of, uh, so concrete, for example, the difficulty of breaking down concrete, the scale of concrete that we will leave behind when we are no longer here. Uh, so it will be a charred earth that might, uh, through things such as mushrooms and other regenerative uh, <clears throat> natural forms, it will have the archive and the legacy, for better or for worse, in the landscape of uh, human intervention long after the humans are no longer here. Uh, so, um, but what's interesting about the, 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 the kind of portrayal of ruins in the, in the romantic tradition is that they uh, started building them. So you can go to parks, in the, particularly in, in the UK, and look at ruins that are built as ruins. So one started as aesthetic objects to build ruins uh, rather than to, to reconstruct and build uh, ancient temples themselves. Uh, and I was reminded of, uh, of this, of course, uh, when uh, two and a half years ago, in April of 2020, some of you probably watched it on television that morning, uh, one of the greatest testaments to uh, Western culture, the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, burned. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, what happened, uh, interestingly, when we think of um, the disaster uh, and the slow violence of climate change, uh, the kind of response from politicians to the burning of the earth, uh, the drowning of the migrants in the Mediterranean, is that uh, we have to be patient and we have to meet again next year and think about what we do because we can't damage the economy, and et cetera, and we have to think of employment. So it's always postponed. But immediately after the, the, the fire at the Notre Dame, uh, the French President Macron uh, went out and said, we will rebuild it. It doesn't matter what it costs, we will rebuild the glory of France, and we will have our church back. Even though the technologies for building such a church doesn't exist today, it will be very difficult to reconstruct it. Uh, so in response to that, uh, uh, in, within a few days, uh, in the French newspaper Liberation, um, the, the philosopher, curator, and activist Paul Preziado uh, wrote a response, and I'll just read part of it 
uh, for you, because I think it's, uh, um, I was very inspired by this particular passage, actually. Um, so, um, also because uh, Preciado can write much more lyrically than I can, so. Uh, At dawn, the cathedral, still smoking, was more beautiful than ever. The open nave, full of ashes, was an iconoclastic monument to the cultural history of the West. A work of art is not a work of art if it cannot be destroyed and therefore be fantasized and imagined. If it can't exist in the immaterial museum of longing and desire, uh, if, it's not, if its loss does not justify intense grief, why couldn't those who clamor for reconstruction wait not even one second to mourn? Destroyers of the planet and annihilators of life, we prefer to build our own ecological ruins. That is why we're afraid to look at the Notre Dame ravaged. Right? So uh, against this front of builders, it's necessary to create a front to defend the Notre Dame of ruins, end of quote. Uh, so uh, um, I think there's, there's, there's a, a lot of stake in this, uh, not just the image that it, that it conjures, but uh, why should we not have time to mourn? Why is it uh, 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 so impossible to mourn? Why can't we allow ourselves the perverse pleasure of watching the destruction of this uh, monument, iconoclastic monument to the culture of the West. Even here with a, with a uh, capital W. Shame on you uh, for that. But uh, so, uh, and then uh, finally, why not leave it in that state? Why not have it be then a new monument in forms of a ruin? Uh, in many ways, if we think of the uh, colonial history uh, of Catholicism, uh, that seems not inappropriate. Uh, so instead of uh, calling this, all these calls, and they came from uh, uh, around the world and uh, other nation states said, we will do anything we can to help, as if though this was a bigger disaster than the uh, many, many people who die at sea while trying to get to Europe you know, on a, a, a weekly basis some of them uh, to French ports and, and specifically to Italian ports. You know, that doesn't call for, that doesn't call for uh, immediate uh, uh, aid um, or immediate participation from various nation states of Europe and beyond. So uh, let's not think of reconstruction. Let's not think of resurrection. And I think those are you know, what I want to, to bring out uh, in terms of thinking of life among the ruins. Let's not try to think of re reparation and return. Let's not think about, uh, or only think about the, the idea that we can return uh, to times past, particularly when we're thinking of climate change. M perhaps we should start thinking from the condition that the point of no return has been crossed and that there is no going home. Uh, so instead of this, uh, obsession with reconstruction, cultural heritage. Uh, Preciado argues against rebuilding the cathedral. Uh, so it will now become a different type of monument. Right? So it's not no longer this monument to the uh, uh, Western civilization and its grandeur. It's rather a monument of loss. So perhaps to a former West. Uh, and indeed, in the text, uh, um, Preciado goes on to call for a new popular front in defense of the ruin. Such a monument would, would, would allow us to not just admire the cathedral, uh, but uh, to mourn it and to contemplate loss as an artistic and aesthetic category. Um, and indeed, of course, uh, 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 Preciado brings up the legacy of uh, destruction. Uh, which we found in the historical avant-gardes of the 20th century, be they artistic uh, or political, right? So this idea that you need to destroy, uh, sometimes violently, 
the tradition and the past in order to achieve and bring about the future. Uh, and this kind of monument could also be seen more abstractly and not just within the history of France and the history of the Catholic Church uh, and the history of Paris, but also be a monument to the kind of burning and destruction of the earth uh, and the anti-monuments that this creates. Uh, we could add to that, I, I think, you know, the, the, the just the absurdity of the speed by which the calls for sudden and decisive action came from officials and politicians, right? And as I said, you can compare that to the hesitation, uh, the deferral, the deliberation, the inaction, and even resistance uh, when the very same officials and politicians are asked to act now to delay the burning of the earth, uh, which I would argue is somewhat more pressing than the burning of the church. Uh, so uh, you could ask, you know, why uh, can we not act and mourn so quickly over the burning of the earth and the slow violence that is climate change, to use uh, Rob Nixon's term, uh, and or for that matter, the kind of vast social inequalities <coughs> that characterize our historical moment, uh, what uh, the Indian Marxist historian has very precisely described as the ruins of the present. So not the ruins of the past, or for that matter, the, the, the ruins of the future, but that we are living in a state of ruin. And um, it sort of struck me, you know, just thought, uh, 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 it, it seems like a good day to talk about these things because uh, it, 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 uh, uh, some of you probably uh, struggled to get here today. Uh, it, was, it took me a very, very, very long time. <laughs> and because I had to both board an airplane, burn fossil fuels, and then get on several trains uh, to get here. Um, and and uh, really, uh, you know, this week with uh, train strikes and a little bit of snow and so on, it feels like you're in this state of ruin. Uh, certainly politics in this country feels like you're in a state of ruin. And indeed, um, the labor conditions we have in this very institution feels like you're in a state of ruin. Uh, so maybe it is about finding life among the ruins and not about repair and accepting the ruin as the condition in which we must act. Um, so, um, but interestingly, I think in, in, uh, in, 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 in the invocation of the ruin as a monument and as a testament, uh, that is a container for the past. I think Preciado's text, which, uh, it, by the way, you can read it online in English because it was published, republished in uh, Art Forum uh, just after it, the, the, the French version in Liberation, so you can find it uh, easily. Um, um, but it, it sort of uh, recalls a, a, an idea that has long, fostered, has long been fostered in cultural theory, uh, which is uh, about the, the, the work the work of museums, and therefore in many ways the work of curation, and this is the series that's supposed to come out of curating, so, uh, um, as uh, dealing with a notion of uh, ruination as uh, a starting point. And here I'm referring to um, uh, one of the most actually uh, one of the most influential and famous kind of essays from something called uh, postmodern art theory, if anybody remembers that. Maybe only Suhail and I remember that. Um, there used to be something called postmodern art theory. Uh, and um, one of the, 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 the proponents of this uh, was uh, um, an, an American uh, art historian and later uh, <laughs> activist. He uh, sort of has an interesting trajectory, actually, um, going from art history into uh, AIDS activism, which is the late Douglas Crimp. Uh, and one of his early essays, which is very famous, is called On the Museum's Ruins. It was published in 1980. Uh, and indeed, um, this was also the title of his first, books, his first book. Uh, and what does he mean by the museum's ruins? Um, so in a way, just like Preciado, uh, and I don't know if it was a deliberate reference or not from Preciado's side. Um, possibly not, actually. Or on the other hand, well, anyway. Crimp was engaged with the possibility of, a, of what was called, you know, this was a very, uh, 
um, important idea in so-called postmodern theory, the uh, possibility of uh, epistemological change uh, and how to open cracks in, the, in solidified and codified discourses. Now, uh, when he wrote this text, uh, he, uh, Krimp was, as I said, was published in 1980 in uh, something called October Magazine, um, which was kind of maybe the signpost of postmodern art theory. Um, he was mainly engaged with, uh, let's say, uh, traditions, traditions of academia, particularly art history, that at the time, uh, art history was uh, uh, infamously or famously late in incorporating, uh, let's say, structural, post-structuralist ideas, feminist ideas, uh, post-colonial ideas, and queer theory into its discourse. Uh, it was much, and psychoanalysis too. It was, it was quite behind you know, things like literary theory and history itself. Um, so he was mainly engaged about that and how art history <coughs> was not just written in academia, but as he would phrase it, it was enacted in the museum. What the museum did was, in, was that it enacted art history. Uh, and uh, um, you could say now, of course, that, that the many art centers and galleries did, that, that we have and that we, some of us work in, some of us have worked in, some of us want to work in, some of us want to run away from, we can discuss that relationship we have to these institutions of contemporary art. But what they do, of course, is enact a discourse that we can call contemporary art and contemporary art theory. Uh, so uh, he wanted to write art history differently and employing cultural and critical theory from both French post-structuralism, mainly Michel Foucault, and from, uh, uh, oddly enough, the Frankfurt School um, of Germany, um, which is a Marxist uh, cultural theory of negation, mainly. Uh, and, and the text was an, uh, mainly an effort to undo orthodoxies of modern art history through a critical use of the term postmodernism, which was at the time people f were convinced that postmodernism had, a, had critical potential. It sl has later been abandoned, uh, particularly in favor of the notion of contemporary art theory and contemporary art. I would sensitively argue that it actually needs to be recaptured because it uses the prefix post. Um, and I think that might be a good way of thinking of the post-future, post, -future, post and, and with post-future uh, and post-human, also post-capitalism. So um, in the text he writes how objects in the museum are uh, of course not timeless or eternal, although that's of course what the museum postulates uh, and the white cube of the commercial gallery as well. Uh, but instead, and this is an interesting re reference to uh, Theodore Adorno, who was the father and grandfather and uh, priest, high priest of the Frankfurt School until he retired just after 1968. Um, he says that what the museum actually does is not show objects as eternal, but it shows them, it's a very interesting phrase, in the process of dying. Uh, so this is a, a, a Adorno, and he called this mutual mortality. Right, and so therefore, uh, Crimp comes up with the metaphor of the museum's ruins as opposed to solidity. So rather to think of institutions as solid uh, and eternal and, uh, should we say, uh, bankable, trustworthy, dependable, depend dependable, uh, they are uh, in a ruinous state, so they are potentially dangerous, uh, not to be trusted. If you enter a ruin, you do so at your own risk. You know, uh, Nick Grimmer would uh, strongly advise you from entering into any ruins, right? That would not follow the health and safety regulations of, of this department. So uh, uh, a, a ruin is, is, is everything uh, that the solid discourses and institutional forms of modernity is not. Uh, so uh, interestingly, strangely enough, this very word ruin uh, that I'm using today is actually only used once in the essay apart from the title. It's very odd. Uh, and, and, uh, but it's perhaps this focus on dying rather than timeless objects that uh, makes uh, 
Crimp turned towards instead Michel Foucault's archaeological analysis of institutions of confinement and famously positioning the art museum as such an institution and art history as its adjacent and supporting discourse. So uh, in his words, in, 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 in Michel Foucault's work, uh, uh, it's always the kind of, the, on the, the way that we can understand institution is not in the abstract. Rather, we understand it through the case, uh, a case history. And the case histories are always the most, perhaps, marginal and extreme. And through those extreme case studies, we can understand how institutionalization and modernization work in terms of producing subjectivity and what uh, Foucault would call, would call docile bodies. So uh, these were all institutions of confinement, right? So the, 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 the famous books from the late 60s and early 1970s of of Michel Foucault was about the prison, uh, about the asylum, uh, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and the hospital. So all places that remove uh, people from everyday life and places them in some sort of confinement, either to principally maybe punish them, or these days, you know, prisons are not supposed to be institutions of punishment, they're called correctional facilities, so it's places to correct antisocial behavior. Uh, the same with the insane asylum, you know, they would have been places to, to, to get uh, pe people who might be dangerous to themselves or others off the streets. Uh, but uh, as we know in modernity, it's also, you know, we care for our, uh, our own citizens anyway, uh, so the national subject, so we care for them and we give them treatment and, and, and so on. Uh, and of course, the same with the, the, the hospital is clearly, it's a place where you remove the sick body from able bodies and uh, everyday life, but in order to, uh, most of the time, heal them, cure them, uh, not in, in, in all cases, of course. Uh, so, but in any way, it's this idea of removing something from the, uh, the normal circulation of bodies and, and, and subjects uh, into a space of confinement that shows us how institutionalization work. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, was also, uh, and it's been much criticized, of course, Crimp's idea that, that that's in a way the same thing that the museum does and, and institutions of art. They, and, and, the, and the whole, let's say, thread within avant-garde projects, even postmodern art projects, have exactly tried to undo this kind of confinement. It has been known uh, in the mid 20th century as the merger between art and life. So art shouldn't be, be separate from life and put into these nice museums. They should be part of life um, and so on. Uh, but uh, what uh, Crimp uh, concludes is that the museum was a discredited institution from its very inception. <laughs> Uh, so I think that's a very interesting phrase, and I think that that perhaps is a, a productive way of looking at uh, future modes of governance and intervention in the art world and the institutions that we inhabit and that uh, sometimes uh, confine us or conceal us and maybe sometimes heal us, I don't know, uh, but as discredited institutions rather than as uh, places of uh, solidity. So if it's discredited, then it's not a temple uh, but perhaps it's a ruin, only attesting to either uh, former glory, right? So the ruin has a former uh, function, uh, a former history uh, that may, have, may, may or may not have been glorious. Um, or it's simply in its state of ruination, in its incompleteness, it has uh, uh, a, a, a value that's... Aesthetic, of course, but here aesthetic in the broader sense of the term. So aesthetic also in the, in the sense of, of uh, lived experience. And indeed, I, I think that this is, um, um, for me, uh, Suhail mentioned it, exactly what, how to think of uh, and coin a, a phrase like uh, a former West. So which doesn't mean that the power of the West and, this, and the symbolic power of it has disappeared. Uh, almost the opposite. But uh, by calling it former, we think of it as a ruin, as a discredited set of institutions, uh, not as a solid 
or eternal or aspirational. Uh, so uh, this brings me back to the, to the notion of the point of no return, right? So what if we think of uh, the, the, the future not as a place where we can return uh, to the 20th century uh, and the 20th century's utopian forms, more or less realized, whether they are uh, techno-scientific liberalism and capitalism at its best, you know, innovative and future oriented uh, like art used to be, maybe, uh, or uh, through, through uh, the notion of um, a kind of communist sublime where we are all equal and technology works for us, not against us, or even through something that seems, you know, Mark Fisher wrote about that, you know, it, 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 it seems utopian now. <laughs> it was not very utopian for those of us who lived through it, but the compromise that is social democracy, that at least, uh, you know, says, okay, there can be uh, uh, benefits, there is a society that takes care of the weak, and there is uh, unemployment benefits, and there is a compromise and some sort of equilibrium between the forces of capital and their destructiveness, and then the forces of collectivity and their... Uh, healing powers and uh, uh, possibilities for repair and um, social cohesion, right? So these were kind of all the, 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 the histories of the possible futures. Uh, with a different scaling, we need to think of them differently. We know that the temporality we think in is very different. We know that uh, lots of the things we have done through all of these projects, because they were all industrial, uh, is, 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 is having have effects on a temporal scale that goes way beyond uh, our habitation of the planet as a species. Um, but rather than to think we can repair that and return to that, and you know, it's not that we shouldn't have these goals about how many degrees the temperature can rise, but let's maybe start from the point of view that they will rise. Right? That we will be, uh, that, the, that the, the catastrophe has already happened, even if we are not necessarily right here, right now, feeling all its consequences. But that some things ha are already irreversible. And then to think in terms of what would it mean to create life among the ruins. And this is where I think that uh, Anna Singh is, is useful. Uh, she, uh, with, with several of her works, but uh, the one I'll, I'll, I'll quote from today is um, the famous one called The Mushroom at the End of the World from 2015. Uh, it's so interesting because the mushroom is here, so she works as an, as an anthropologist and is interested in what she calls acts of noticing uh, and how you actually untangle uh, histories that goes, uh, has different temporalities, but at the same time are very contemporary. Uh, she basically follows uh, uh, the, the, the histories and stories of uh, um, people who, pook, who pick uh, mushrooms in Oregon, and most of them uh, um, Asian immigrants, from, uh, with lots of conflicts between them, uh, between Japanese, Vietnamese, etc. Uh, so this act of noticing it actually shows you know, entanglement, how something like the social structure of uh, collecting mushrooms has to do with uh, what she calls latent commons, the fact that these are regenerating certain areas and that they are existing on somehow outside of a capitalist economy proper, but at the same time, they do, the mushrooms do circulate in a capitalist economy as a commodity. Uh, and, uh, and it's kind of, uh, it's not so different from Foucault's uh, case studies, actually, that the fact that you work with something uh, in its entanglement rather than its isolation allows you to notice things and, and to talk about different scales and the problems of scaling. Um, and, but the, the, this book has a, a, an interesting, which is often forgotten, you know, which is where I, I kind of borrowed my title from a little bit. I realized I should have called it Life and Afterlife in, in the Ruins, but okay. Uh, because it's called On the Possibility of Life in the Capitalist Ruins. And that's meant very concretely that's what mushrooms do. Mushroom pickers do that too. They don't work. They work 
by definition, with precarity, not with social security, not with uh, um, uh, fixed labor contracts, etc. And there are interviews with some of them. A lot of them prefer it not to have that. It's, um, but let's not go into those details. But what would be the kind of uh, uh, the mushroom at the end of the world is, is, has a relationship to the destruction of the world and the first thing that comes after any destructions are mushrooms. But it's also the fact that there is this economy building up around something uh, as complicated and simple at the same time as intuitive and um, uh, regulated as the picking of mushrooms are uh, shows us that there are a possible life in the capitalist ruins. So the capitalist ruins don't, doesn't necessarily lead to death and destruction, even though they do that too. But she's actually interested in what would be the life forms, human as non-humans, within these ruins. Uh, so uh, towards the end of the book, she writes uh, about the notion of futurity and the loss of futurity that, that I mentioned with the kind of the techno-liberalism communism and even social democracy, all of them not really, uh, not just in ecological terms, but also in ideological terms, does not really seem to tell us much as propositions for a future. Uh, she says, without stories of progress, this is something that we also looked at in former West, actually, what if progress is progress to the worse, right? She says, without stories of progress, the world has become a terrifying place. The ruin glares at us with the horror of its abandonment. It is not easy to know how to make a life, much less avert planetary destruction, right? And I think that's, that's uh, very much the case, I think, uh, probably also generationally now. You know, it's not easy to know how to make a life in, situ in situations of destruction and precarity. You know, it's, 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 it's extremely difficult. Yeah, uh, and then of course, much less avert planetary destruction. Again, you know how how do you do that as an individual, as collectives? Uh, so, so she says it's not easy to know how to make a life, much less avert planetary destruction. Luckily, there is still company, human and non-human, and that sort of returns us to Ivala Frank's uh, film because it's actually about. Uh, there's these very moving interviews with these uh, young teenagers that talk about friendship and love and what they imagine in the future. Uh, we can still explore the overgrown verges of our blasted landscapes, the edges of capitalist discipline, scalability, and abandoned resource plantations. We can still catch the scent of the latent commons and the elusive uh, autumn aroma. Um, so I think that's maybe a good place to end and, and have a conversation instead. Um, we can talk about ecology af at, after the end of the world and hyperobjects some other time. <laughs> um, but maybe just stick with these ideas for now. All right, thank you, Simon. Um, so that's... that's uh, a lot to wrap my head around <laughs> in that. Um, and there's obviously kind of a number of provocations and also some kind of fairly um, incisive formulations, I think, about where we are. So this general sense of ruination and uh, things just aren't working very well, which, you know, as you said, it's there because of like train strikes, like basic infrastructure doesn't work, even in, I think, what is currently the sixth richest country in the world, <laughs> yeah. but like, that doesn't seem to make sense. Although if you look at GDP figures, mm. uh, they do hide that, um, I think as somebody said, I can't remember where I saw this, um, Britain is essentially a very poor country with very few very wealthy people, yeah. which is true also for the United States and most of the kind of high, highly neoliberalized societies. So it makes sense that there's a general breakdown of infrastructure as well as this being a political program to kind of um, push towards privatization. And there's a talk by Jamil Mahwood last, last year we're talking about this has basically been a project of Lebanon for the last 20, 30 years, and they're seeing, so you know, Lebanon's just like yeah, yeah. Ten, 10 years ahead of everyone else, uh, which is like bad news for everybody. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's, there's, there's quite an um, uh, uh, insightful description, uh, kind of use of ruination, 
as a description of a general condition of even even rich societies as well as poorer societies. Um, but it's also a provocative one, especially the thought that we kind of kind of surrender or move move on from I think utopian thinking or a sense that we can build towards a, um, a kind of future that we want and maybe just try and find a way through the ruins. So I kind of want to ask some broader questions. I've got three, three central questions. But the one I want to start with is much more particular and specific and it's to do with the art museum as a ruin. And I take, I take the kind of theoretical description from Adorno, uh, from Crimp, who was using this notion of the museal, what was it, the museal? Mortality, yeah. Museal mortality. So when you stick something into a museum, it basically loses its connection to the life world from which it's been drawn from. Uh, you, you see this a lot in reparation and restitution arguments that you know, the, the object needs to be returned to its, its indigenous culture because in the Western Museum, it's just like, uh, it, it, it's dead. It doesn't, it doesn't um, function. Um, but that's true maybe of all, everything that enters the museum. Um, that's, that, that seems, I can, I can see that. <laughs> It doesn't really make sense to me to think of the contemporary art museum, not just institutions but museums, as ruins, because they're incredibly successful at the moment, right? So contemporary art institutions are sort of uh, really important to nation building projects. So if you're, I don't know, Qatar, for example, <laughs> uh, um, you know, it's in, uh, like D Dubai, kind of the United Arab Emirates and so on, mm. you really need like the new Louvre, you need the Guggenheim, you need your own uh, kind of national national project, um, the you know institutions like the Tate and this country, the Louvre and so on and so forth, um, even places like Palais de Tokyo and sort of those medium scale institutions are all really endorsed. I mean, not necessarily financially, and I think there's quite an important thing to be said about how, um, as with many universities in this country, if not internationally, on the outside they look great. <laughs> they look like they're functioning really well. Mm. But on the inside, it's a shit show. Um, speaking for a friend. Um, so so I, think, I think maybe there's something about the pragmatics, but it does seem to me, nonetheless, that contemporary institutions certainly um, uh, show themselves as to be anything but ruins. Contemporary art is the kind of vibrant moment of the culture. Um, the kind of major tourist attractors, they get a lot of investment and funding from like centralized institutions and so on. So I'm just wondering kind of the, the theoretical description of the museum is ruined or mm. that's, that's restricted to contemporary art museum and not contemporary art institution. Contemporary art museum uh, makes sense, but it seems against the kind of pragmatics of what contemporary has become in the last, exactly of this period of institutional decline. No, yeah, but that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think, trying to think of where to start my answer. One is that I'm not sure that they still, and also in the very near future, means as long, as much as, let's say, the Qataris think. So that's, that's, that's the, the, the first uh, thing. Um, I think that this uh, investment uh, had a had a historical period that I think I'm not sure that that's continuing um, on on a global scale on planetary here global scale that is that is going to continue this idea of uh, of growth of contemporary art um, and I think uh, so I think they might just be a little bit out of time I think if they were really clever you know I saw that they one of the stadiums was built to be destroyed right. On the, uh, the shipping car. container one, yeah, yeah. They, which they already destroyed. So they could actually, you know, they could just leave them as ruins <laughs> and then have tourists come and look at that. Uh, I think, but um, um, but anyway, Qatar is such a specific uh, case and strange place, also with its relationship to tourism. Uh, and uh, there is a certain, there has to be an enormous element of denial um, because the the uh, abundance of wealth in that region is only there as long as we keep. Uh, uh, our uh, what was the phrase in in your Frank's film? Uh, uh, our kind of drug dependency on fossil fuels, right? So so it's 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 running against a certain historical tide. Uh, it may be able to run 
towards that against that for a very long time. That's that's I'm not denying that. But uh, so I think that's that the cultural forms are. Well, maybe that's why they're contemporary art because they're not future oriented. Uh, so that's, 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 but it's not a clear argument, that's just sort of what I'm thinking in terms of what you're saying. Where? But uh, then the other thing is, of course, that I, I, I would also say that they create, they might have these shiny surfaces, but the effects they create are those of ruination, uh, environmentally, in this case, uh, if we're thinking of particularly. Uh, I, I saw this, it's really, I mean, it's again, it's very fascinating to just because it's happening now, just to look at the World Cup in Qatar which they claim is the first climate neutral uh, major sporting event or World Cup of, of uh, football. Uh, and of course it's completely emotional, it's absolutely untrue. Um, um, but uh, um, so I think it does create ruins and it does so uh, on the back of those buildings concretely and it does so within them too, within the, the, the conditions of work. Uh, and we see that here I think it's now very clear, you said you, you used the term chicho, uh quoting this friend. Um, but but indeed uh, that that, that, that the, the, the conditions within these institutions of solidity uh, are in, uh, are in the same mood. I mean it's just it, they just had this huge uh, occupation of the new school in New York as well. So I think there's a lot of uh, growing consciousness around the fact that and that's why I I I, I I, I realize the provocation in it, but I think it's good that we, if we actually, so it's not to avoid utopian thinking, but it's rather to avoid the mistakes of previous utopian thinking, which is to not just think in terms of uh, the better world we can create together has to go through so and so many technological advances, but rather say it has to start from the fact of ruination. We have to start learning from the mushrooms. Mm. That, 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 that's, 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 if that's utopian, I don't know, but it's a, it's a, it's a, so I, yeah, we can talk about Peter Fraser afterwards, but, uh, so, um, for me, it would be useful, I think for us as, as practitioners and cultural producers, if we start to think of our institutions as discredited, uh, not as, uh, having, uh, all these kind of values and authorities that we've ascribed to them. But to actually say they're there, they may have had them, we don't know, it doesn't matter, but we can only see the ruins of it now. All right, I've got, I've got a number of other. Can I just see if anybody wants to raise the point? Um, but let's just go straight to you. Can you just wait for the mic? Oh. Why do you think postmodernism is particularly um, important in conjunction with climate change? Um, other than the prefix, probably. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if it's it's uh, it's. I, I think this is kind of actually Sway should probably answer that more than me in a, in, the, in a way because it's it's. Uh, um, we got rid of that term because it it, it seemed to imply historical progression uh, that, okay, we were in, postmodernism was, at some point it was used interchangeably with the notion of late modernism, uh, or even late capitalism, which, you know, uh, Frederick Jameson has been heavily ridiculed for saying, because it seems like capitalism has only grown since he wrote about postmodernism as a form of late capitalism uh, in the early 1990s, I think it was when he put out that, that particular volume. Um, but I think that um, it implied that something that was solid has melted into air uh, and that we need to think of it through the former. Uh, and, and that's what I would consider recapturing, <laughs> if you will, or uh, actualizing uh, as, a, as a perhaps as an uh, alternative to the, to the dead end of and that's why I'm looking at Suhail, you know, because if contemporary art is a historical period, not just what's happening in our actuality, then it needs to be periodicized. It cannot not be periodicized, so it has to be replaced uh, at some point, uh, the same way that modern art, classical art was. And that's a conundrum that I think everybody working in practice now, because the, the term 
itself doesn't imply uh, a historical present or a specific style. It just says contemporary, so it could be anything. So uh, um, that's why maybe by revisiting uh, the postmodern, we could think of our future beginning from the state of uh, not the, what's the what's the what is of some disrepair. Right, that the, the actuality we're in is 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 uh, one of disrepair, to put it mildly. Okay. You, want oh, you want you? No, you can have a follow-up. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not a follow-up, actually. It's just about the um, fungi as an organism. It's like a nice metaphor for the fungi as an organism. It's like a nice metaphor, but ultimately, I mean, it's very different to humanity. I know I'm very, like, human-centered, yeah. mm-hmm. but, I mean, they're just growing and stuff, you know? It's like... Well, I mean... The, the, no, but we don't necessarily know that because in the way that they create spores, it seems to be a quite, I would say, it's a quite complex life form actually. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I've seen fantastic fungi and everything. It's a very big topic in the outcome. I think you've got to concede the point. <laughs> I think it's like fungi on humans. Like, no, they're obviously not. No, but so how, like. What elements do you think are good to, or like whatever, like biomimicry, or I don't know, like what, 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 what other agents in fungi that could benefit living amongst the world? Well, because they, they of course, they, they are regenerative in terms of pollution, and they are also nutritious. Uh, so there's quite a lot uh, uh, to be taken from that. And then, of course, in terms of just a, in, in terms of methodology, let's say, and, and if you will, metaphor, it's a way of saying, okay, we can, you know, it's not recreation, but it's rather a creation, if you will, of something that is life, but also afterlife, in a state of ruination. Maurice. Um, hi. Uh, I was wondering, because you described the current museum as sort of a ruin of contemporary art, with contemporary art being a period that we should see as a period coming to an end. Um, I wonder, with curating, where does that lead us? Like, will, is it still, is there still room in the museum to curate in a way that is forward-thinking, or should we go to the new places and spaces? Well, I think we should do both. You know, um, when when it's, it's um, I think that certainly a, a, a lot of institutions, particularly now that they are in a ruined state, makes it strangely. Well, not strange, but it makes it, on one hand, more difficult to do things there. It was already not, it already has a lot of difficulties because of, well, institutional disparity, basically. Um, so it, it, it's already faced with a lot of obstacles as, as a kind of systemic uh, um, block or, or, or formation. Um, but uh, uh, so, on the first hand, we would say that the, the, the state of ruination makes it more difficult. But it doesn't have to. Uh, so uh, if you think about how do we use these buildings, what do we do with them when there isn't that kind of funding that used to be before, uh, for example, when there isn't the systems in place, well, maybe that means that that's exactly the moment when they can become more democratic. And we, we, and we put different stuff in them. Um, because. The museums themselves, um, due uh, to the way that state funding is uh, becoming defunding almost everywhere, um, certainly in the far west, um, and they either transform themselves into purely private enterprises, which they sometimes legally can't do, or they have to find another uh, justification uh, for being there. Take the last one. Um, so I, I, I want to lead to a question around uh, following on from the previous response of yours 
like where where you see the signs of real life ruination rather than theoretical ruination in contemporary art because it, it suggests there's a kind of phase shift uh, and we can see early signs of this contemporary art thing not quite working but just to come back to the privatization model again it seems right to me because you know if you look at the privatized uh, contemporary art sector not not in not in totality because of course it means most people don't do very well like 95 percent if not more don't do very well from from commercial art sector at all, uh, and, and also therefore from the public uh, public art sector, because they're very independent. But, you know, again, the, the external side of it, which would be, say, free art fair locally, but that's now kind of a international model, or kind of borrowed, rather, from the art as an international model, it looks like it's you know, going full on. It's, it's like, it's not, that's not an indicator in reputational terms or invisibility, or in a, kind of the significance of contemporary art to a sense of a transnational public, which does very well for itself, like an elite, an elite culture, a transnational elite culture. Contemporary art does looks very far from ruination. It looks like it's doing exceedingly well. I mean, if you're a good leftist, you kind of you know, grumble about that and go, that's exactly, exactly the index of its ruin, because it's not serving any critical kind of counter counter hegemonic function, right? This is kind of perpetuating elitism. Um, but I, I guess I'm I, so so again I'd sort of push a little bit further as to where where the real life ruination. And I completely take the point that of course all art fairs, all biennials, most art exhibitions mean a huge carbon burn uh, for very few people and require huge amounts of precarity and so on and so forth. Um, but those, those are kind of like infrastructural ruination, and that seems to me different to the kind of cultural notion of ruin or the kind of, uh, the, 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 uh, the kind of visible index of what contemporary art is doing. Uh, so I'm just wondering, one, um, yeah, what, what, where, where do you see the kind of edges of the ruin made visible to us in terms of or contemporary art into their public space, rather than like infrastructure, if, if you do. Or maybe you're kind of saying like, let's get ready for it. Uh, well, probably more than that, but, but I think that there's, there's um, one of the reasons that contemporary art in all its forms could be commercialized to the extent that it, that it did was that it is actually postmodern. That it has remnants of uh, utopian projects. That it has remnants of um, subject subjectivity production. So so, so uh, the, the the kind of the art discourse, even in Freeze magazine or Art Review, hasn't given up on that notion. But the the gap between whatever is left of that and then what's going on aesthetically and socially in terms of the art fairs and then also infrastructurally is growing wider and wider mm -hmm. and in that I think we will see some sort of ruination uh, so uh, let's imagine that you can privatize it even more <coughs> what will then be the public that you claim and that you want to uh, reflect your values upon. If they, if they don't exist, then I think it will disappear like so many other cultural forms, um, despite the money that's invested into it. But whether we're very far from that moment or whether there will be changes in that, I can't say, I don't know. Um, I agree with you that it's strange because my, uh, you know, we talked about this a few years ago, my predictions was with the, with the kind of rise of uh, the strange changes, I think, in the in the kind of political and economic structures that guide contemporary art, which is between nationhood and private interest and a certain notion of progressive new liberalism and and its um, identity politics, that that seems to be under threat from austerity and from uh, right wing populism. So there seems to be a kind of political divestment in that system. Uh, 
but we don't see any uh, any effects of that in the RFS so far as I can tell. I, I haven't. I don't know if they're not transparent with their numbers. I don't know. I know they have other problems in terms of ruination, but then again, infrastructural. So if you talk to the medium-sized and smaller galleries, some of them say, well, it's going the same way as the entertainment industry and the music industry, and in 10 years, there'll just be three galleries. <coughs> right, and they'll be uh, Hauser and Wood and Sviena and uh, Gagosian, and they'll have a huge stable of artists, and nobody else will be able to live as, a, as an art dealer. You, can, you know, galleries in this town are saying that. Uh, so they, they feel, you know, the, the ruination of the system that they work within. They protest against the prices they have to pay at the art fairs. They protest against the fact that they, as emerging galleries, are asked by the art fairs not to show commercial work, but to do projects, which they then can't sell, so it costs them a lot of money, but they're not in the circuit of recognition if they don't do it. So it's a little bit of damned if you do and damned if you don't. And, I, and again, this, these are, you know, that's precarity, and at some point those things stretch to a breaking point. <laughs> this question from right here. Does anybody have a, at the back got any? There's, okay, there's going to be one, a couple at the back as well. We'll take those after you. Okay. I'm still kind of formulating my question, so forgive me. Um, but, so I understand that ruin is very fertile ground. So, kind of like going back to this idea of the mushroom and sort of this disappearance of like temporary art and the way that we know it. Um, so obviously, like when we, when I think of mushrooms, I think of like, not only thriving and growing and growing, but also being a bit invasive. Mm -hmm. And so it's making me think of well, like what are your thoughts of art also kind of like. Um, Speaking into other institutions because there's there's ruin everywhere, right? There's fertile ground everywhere. So, do the art mushrooms only grow in the art area, like, or can they like also like infiltrate these other areas and kind of grow there? So that's kind of what I'm thinking about. If that makes sense. Well, we'll say yes. I mean, and, and that's that's for sure happening already, and has been happening for a long time. So, uh, yeah, it's it's it's. You know, mushrooms and ruins there, uh, if I made them sound more attractive than they are, I apologize. <laughs> uh, that, wasn't the, that wasn't the idea, so they're filled with risk. Uh, my idea is more to think of that as the condition rather than solidity and uh, the kind of institutions of credit, credit in all senses of that term, uh, and to think of the discredited and the ruinous and what are then the possibility of the life in those ruins, because I, I, that is, you know, there was in the film, there's, there's this uh, climate um, scientist who was supposed to short a ship, uh, it could be software, but in the film he's asked, it's an American guy, and he's looking at the smelting of the ice caps, and he's been studying this for 20 years, uh, or 40 years, he's an older man, and, and the, the filmmaker asks him, you know, what will you say to future generations? And he says, I'm sorry. That's all I have to say, I'm sorry for the fact of what we left you. And I am too. Even though I'm not a baby boomer, I'm just on the other side of it. Um, but, but that's, 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 um, um, that's my friend, why don't I see that? Uh, but yeah, the, the, the world that's going, that, that will be left behind to humans and non-humans uh, is fucked up. And it will not be able to repair it uh, to the uh, um, fossil fuel consumer madness of Europe and the United States in the 20th century. So that's, that's, that's sort of my point, that we have to start from that, to accept that. You can do it through mourning as well. I, I, I think that there's, you know, all the left is like, how should we mourn the loss of the... I don't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> other things, but... Uh, or as me, uh, so we have all the left is like... Um, you know, more on those utopias for sure, the loss of those utopias. Um, but we, uh, we, I, I just, I, I think we have to accept that there is no going back to those um, forms of life. Okay, so there's, I did, was it a question at the very back? And then there was, okay, done. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask you 
want to kind of go back to the relation, because you talked about contemporary art being a relation, um, and that, and then also about how institutions are in the state of relation. Um, but I don't really understand that point, to be honest, because I think um, there are more people you know, going to um, institutions, um, obtaining PhDs, and there are more artists, um, more educated artists. And I think even this year in our MFA program, we had like 80 people. So it's, it, I don't know, almost double <laughs> as the year before. Um, so I think I can understand from a perspective of organization that maybe the uh, institutions are not as organized, but in terms of people, there are more people going to education, I think. And when I think of ruins, I think of an empty space, like lacking, I don't know, interest. And I think that's the opposite in some way. So I don't know, maybe you can elaborate on that a bit. Like what do you mean by Relation. Well, I think that just there are several things to, to say about that. I mean, one is that, 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 that there's a kind of a ideological aspect to it. But uh, in terms of more and more people going into education, I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. Um, and it won't be in the future because we're having smaller generations. So uh, the universities will shrink. And it is a shrinking sector in this country, even if the MFA has a massive full recruitment on their hands this year, um, for, for whatever reasons that might be. Uh, but, uh, but I think in, 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 in terms of the, the, the university as a market in this country, it's certainly facing, some are literally facing ruination financially. For example, Birkbeck that are laying off like 60 to 80 academics this year um, because they they, 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 don't, uh, they don't get the recruitment that they need. So, um, so I would question that actually as a premise a little bit. Um, but again, a lot of economists or sociologists. So, uh, but my point is, you know, that's, that's kind of self deprecating, but I, you know, I'm 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 part of the uh, the discourse of of this ruin, you know. I'm part of uh, what's left behind, you know, in the little contact time I may or may not have with students. That's that's so the ruins aren't empty, you know. We are all in it. <laughs> so my uh, my provocation, or that's the ideological side. Let's let's see that then as the stage upon which we interact. Uh, that so the wound is not empty. Moreover, which is a whole, of course, different story. I would also say the ruins are never empty, uh, even if there's no humans in them. And here I'm not necessarily thinking of the non-human. I'm thinking of the post-human, the sense of the ghost, because if anything, they are full of ghosts. Uh, indeed, actually, and the same writes about that about certain mountains that the uh, mushroom pigs will not go to because they're full of ghosts of the indigenous people who used to live there. Um, but uh, it, this is another um, aspect that needs to uh, be considered. It's this kind of afterlife you know, of the ghost that's everywhere in, in our institutions and in our histories and, uh, and should be, be understood not just purely as a kind of metaphor of a pre-modern uh, past, but as a well, every goal and goal is a category of haunting. The fact that we live in societies and times that are haunted. And it's only, you know, in the, mostly anyway, the Christians, you know, that were, they were so afraid of the ghosts that we put these huge headstones on the graves so that they don't come up, you know. We, we don't want to commune with them. Um, but uh, other histories and other cultures accept that as presence. So I don't think that, uh, that uh, if this is a ruin that is empty, or I mean, I'm looking around and seeing it's not, but I don't think that, that uh, for me, that the notion of the ruin means emptiness. I mean, I've got to, I've got to follow. I can explain the thing about the over recruitment this year. <laughs> <laughs> so it's basically kind of a follow through from COVID and strikes and so on. So a lot of people who deferred came back on top of the recruitment. 
and it was sort of, I wasn't here at the time because it was a mess up. Um, but, but we have increased our targets, so we would now be recruiting people than we did before because um, it's the only way to continue funding the university. Do you, do you, is that a question on this point? Or? No. Okay. Can, can I just follow up with, with Simon's point? Because like, I think coming from this question and the sense of, like, I think my sense of what's around in your question is that, um, or even with the notion of ruin, actually, I'll, I'll kind of detach it from what you asked. Um, is, is it seems like a melancholic and sad place right? mm -hmm. against the kind of full life that is happening elsewhere in, you know, like there's a party and then there's a ruin essentially the two, of the two poles but it seems to me that if, if, you're, if we're very serious about saying okay look we've, we've gone past the point of no return and that seems to me true because all this one and a half percent stuff is just like forget it that's gone like there will not be a political settlement heading towards that so we need to think about what are the conditions that we enter and how do we work in them the, one, of, one of the problems, I think, with the word ruin, I can see why it works, because we can no longer hold on to previous uh, institutions or even previous utopian visions or previous paradigms. But there is a sense with ruin that you're in a kind of uh, broken down, dysfunctional, not working kind of thing. But it, it, my sense is that if you follow through from your logic, we have to kind of convert also the horizon or the kind of sense of what political action means, right? Away, away from a utopian vision, away from a notion of like full repair or like, a, a, you know, a, a life that's rich and full. The, the life of the party is gone. <laughs> so we just kind of have to go on with what we're left with. And, and I'm saying this partly because of one, it's the last talk of this year, and it seems like a very sad note to finish on <laughs> this series. <laughs> Tears were well, like, oh, it's all ruins, and we should all be terribly sad. There, there seems to be something in the in the surrendering the previous paradigms is also a moment of invention, not just of like the practices, but the um, the vision or kind of the paradigm of what of how and what to do in terms of actions and interventions and indeed practices altogether. So I just kind of want to, like, the ruin still seems to be a little bit attached to the notion of, like, the past, which is no longer available. It doesn't seem quite future-facing enough for this kind of emergence, because actually what's needed is, like, what do we do when we no longer have the kind of leftist model of either the utopian vision or kind of, uh, you know, kind of a good collective organisation because you actually need very good resources and good institutions to make that. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, I'll be the first to admit that my so-called logic is very fuzzy. Uh, so, so that that's um, for sure. Uh, I think it, there's there's different timelines competing with each other. I think so. Um, I think it was last year or two years ago. Uh, I organized a conference on uh, monstrosity. Uh, thinking of this as the time of monsters, uh, the interregnum, which comes from Gramsci, the fact that an old system is dying, and new is yet to be born, but the dying of the old prevents the new from being born, and instead all these monsters appear. Uh, and we looked at that in terms of monster films, and one of the, 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 the speakers we had was the now late Mike Davis, uh, who has written about monsters in terms of viruses, and, 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 and certainly captures ruins. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, we didn't know that at that time that he was uh, ill, quite ill, and, and he knew that his time was up. But uh, uh, he said something very interesting, uh, which was he said, Well, it seems to me, and uh, he was, I don't know how old he was, but in his 70s, uh, so called uh, so Boomer, and he said, Well, it seems to me, sadly, that my generation uh, of Americans, he's in, in California, have decided to take and spend and use all the best things in life just for themselves, right? And I kind of agree with that uh, assessment. Uh, but um, that, so as long as we have this huge generation uh, still controlling uh, policies, even also in terms of politicians from much younger who see them as a major voting group, uh, it will very little get done. But they won't be around forever. 
you know, their time is soon up. They will manage to leave behind a lot of destruction. Also good things, they're not all bad people. Uh, right, so, but once that happens, you'll have a completely different scenario, possibly in the ruins of that, you know, metaphorically or, 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 or actually, and both in terms of climate, both in terms of, let's say, depleted state systems, educational systems, etc. But you will have it all to yourselves. And there won't be as many to share. So in that, I think, lies an enormous opportunity, actually. Because uh, uh, we're talking now about scarcity uh, of resources and um, goods, even luxury. But that scarcity will decrease. So will the nation. So we have these two timelines. It's very difficult to say, you know, whether they will meet or not. But you have those two timelines. So, you know, it's all going to be yours. And there won't be many around. You know, the, the, the population uh, 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 has peaked on a global scale. Um, so that, you know, it massive changes if we're thinking again of planetary scale and other temporalities. So outside of the current beliefs. At the same time, a lot of things will, a lot of the infrastructure will be in various states of ruination. So that's why I'm saying it's not to, to think in terms of the repair of that, but rather what do we develop within those rooms for those who will take over, which is basically going to be all of you guys and everyone else in your age group. All right, not yet for the last. I don't know if my question makes sense to ask It's fine, just ask it. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I just think it would be helpful, at least for me, because I, like, in, in listening, it feels like you've talked kind of about specifically what ruination isn't for you, but not so much of, like, what is it? Um, so how are you thinking about it? Is ruination or ruin in terms of, like, the adoption of the thing, like how widespread it's adopted, is it in terms of the effects of the thing? Is it in terms of how effective it is at what it's doing? Like, what is the specific breakdown that you are calling ruination? So that's, uh, in a way, simple to answer. That's, that's, our, uh, that's our contemporary answer. We just need to look around and see all the crumbling structures, you know, and they're not just crumbling in terms of the infrastructure and the, and the physical things and the climate, but also in terms of the discourses. You know, the discourses, the discourse around what a human subject is, is in total disrepair. We would be able, I mean, we would, it would be ridiculous to, to, to talk about the way we've been talked about, let's say, even in the postmodern era, as a kind of censured subject, uh, gender in specific ways, etc. We, we, we won't we would be able to, to do that now. Uh, so those, those, a lot of the concepts of the universities are, I think, discursively uh, in a state of ruin. Um, but that doesn't mean that they are not still standing, right? It just means that we need to think of them not necessarily as solid, we need to think of them as risk, risk field, we need to think of them as, if you will, discredited. So that's not the same as abandonment, but it's accepting that they are not fully functioning in the way that they pretended and in the way that they maybe did function. In a way, it doesn't matter so much whether they actually function that way or whether we just used to think they functioned that way. I, two, I saw two, two questions here, Katie and Pfizer. Um, and then this will be the last two. Um, uh, my question is, uh, what do you think about the use of ruins as um, a tool for colonialism and oppression because this can easily, uh, and there are many examples. And so, how, where, how does that exist within what you're can you saying? Can you just say a little bit more why, why you think about colonialism and oppression in terms of the room? <laughs> <laughs> um, because I'm Palestinian. <laughs> <laughs> No, just, be, just, be, spell, just spell it out. Uh, because I feel that this is something that uh, has been used for um, from the mid-19th century to portray uh, Palestine as a ruin. 
and you know, for example, and so therefore the people don't exist, therefore it's okay to colonize, and you can apply that to many other places uh, and many other examples. So yeah, that's that's my question. What's the danger of this ruination? Because also in what you talked about, you you gave us the perspective of of uh, the West, uh, you know, um, this romantic kind of idea of, of, of ruins, but uh, what about us? <laughs> so, no, well, I, I'll answer that specifically, but just to say, you know, that, 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 that the movement of the post colony is also a moment of ruination. And uh, Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana, recognized this immediately after independence. When he used the first term, he first used the term decolonization, which is okay. Well, we've we've we're a post colony. We've liberated ourselves from our colonizers, but we're still not decolonized because all the institutions that we have are institutions that were given to us by the British, and some sort of disrepair, and our currency depended on them, and etc. So says we're actually not free at all. So I think that the, the precisely we can learn from post-coloniality that that's, for better or for worse, always been a negotiation of ruination. At the same time, of course, it was also always a moment of utopia, of international utopia and modernization. It was also a modernization project. So these are the map, maybe, I don't know if that's the danger, but that's the complexity of it. So there's a tendency in the West to think that it wasn't a modernization project, because obviously it was. Uh, decolonization was also a modernization project, um, but maybe a different type of modernity. But I think, with, particularly with, with Palestine, um, obviously one of the main political tools are, are, uh, are, are in terms of architectural tracing of roots, right? Which is, um, name escapes me, but um, what's the name of this group? Rivak. Uh, Rivak, yeah, that exactly does that to show. Show the ruins shows that no, we were here, and this was an actual building, and this was a factory, right? So there, actually, the ruin becomes a, 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 a an instrument of uh, political struggle and and remembrance, you know, not mourning, but remembrance and actualization of uh, the, the, the the Palestinian right to uh, self determination. But right. you can't compare Rwak to a state, you know, and this is where it becomes complicated, where who has agency over controlling the concept of Irwin? It's the strongest, so then what do you do? What's the future? Yeah, but I think this, this example is exactly the opposite, no? It's a, it's, a, it's, a move, it's a move to rewrite the history that claims that they, they on the Palestinians, were never there, and never there in a sense of being modern. So, the ruined groups... <laughs> we, we know you're there, it's really... <laughs> proves that, right? So there it becomes an, an instrument of, of political struggle, not used by the state. So it's not exclusive to the state, I would say, at all. Indeed, I would say most state systems, like, I don't think that this, this government, or for that matter, our governance here, I don't think the warden would accept, you know, I think St. Francis Conn would like the idea of me saying that this place is in ruins. You know, she would say, no, I'm exceptionally not, it's under, underwent reform. So it would be better and bigger and stronger. Right, so it's not the it's not the language of uh, power, but of course it could be. Uh, really, and that's the sense where it becomes the uh, uh, that's the, the but that that's why I said it's not an empty shell. You know, it's full of uh, ghosts and possibilities and impossibilities, and like everything else, it can be of course uh, used from as an instrument of power. Do you want to? Ask? Um, I was thinking about, um, you mentioned, um, like, <clears throat> like uh, how this uh, generation would, like, make a life, and about, like, generationality in relation to you speaking about ruination, especially with your comment of being a, kind of, um, 
getting on in years left us. <laughs> um, I don't know who it, but um, what, he said, do you think that this concept of ruination is to do with generationality <laughs> and perhaps to do with um, being around in the second half of the 20th century? Or do you think that this theory would continue to the next generation or to our generation? And do you think it should? Mm -hmm. Um, so, the Carmel answer is that that's not for me to answer, but for you, but uh, I won't stop there. So, uh, it is very generational, uh, and I think that we have, uh, we have not just institutional disparity in this world, we have generational disparity. Uh, and so, um, by quoting Mike Davis, that, that, that the point is, and there's also, you know, climate change denial is part of that, is the refusal of acknowledging the destruction that our lifestyle has brought with it. Brought with it. But it's also probably with the knowledge. Uh, so there are groups, you know, of uh, retirees um, against uh, uh, for ecology and against uh, uh, um, you know, climate destruction. So there are, of course, also older people who are in solidarity with younger people. But a lot are in denial. And maybe subconsciously, they also know that they won't have to pay the bill. I mean, this is just again a biological fact. They won't have to pay the bill. So we're sort of, we, 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 we just sort of tail end of that welfare system. So, and we know that, yeah, it's not a solid in terms of work relations, pensions, uh, the future of us and our children and our children's children. Sorry to say, we, I, sorry. Uh, but that, that's, you know, it, that's generational uh, 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 consciousness uh, that m most people I know, or maybe they're all um, college leftists, have. Uh, and it's going to affect, be more effective. So what I said about, well, this will be, there will be ruins, maybe very well-functioning ruins that hardly are ruinous. Maybe it's just a few power sockets that don't work. You can repair them in five minutes. But it's all going to, to be uh, given not in its pristine or current condition, but in some condition of further disrepair, I would say, if you're fairly confident about that. It will be given, of course, to everybody who's, who's you know, younger uh, students, emerging artists who are in this room and in other rooms like it. So I would think that, that I would think that it would be uh, relevant to think about. But that's, you know, I can't decide that for you. I, I really agree <laughs> with you, personally, like, I don't know, I feel like you have to have, like, some kind of, like, relative lived history to, like, mm -hmm. utopianism, post-utopianism, post-modernism, to, like, situate mm -hmm. this concept of the room within that kind of a triangulated theoretical world that you lived in. That, like, so, I don't know, I think... I think that the ruin, or as a concept, doesn't have a long lifespan, somehow, <laughs> paradoxically. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so then, let me give a... <laughs> people are speaking something. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, I think it's nicely phrased by you asking, who is the ruin here? <laughs> uh, in a very gentle, you know, very, very kind of attenuated way, but it's a good question. But it seems to me that one, just to go back to like a positive version of the ruin, because again, it sounds like it sounds it sounds like an okay boomer kind of argument in a way. Um, but so you, you mentioned subjectivities earlier, but I think one of the things that is happening now is that everyone is testing and sort of representing and trying to find articulations. Of different types of subjectivity. That's what many artists are involved with at this point in time, and we do that, and it's and you know we're fine with it. It's not really something that people need to kind of make the initial case of like I'm going to I'm going to show another type of subjectivity than the cis gender cis male white you know, pale cis male kind of subjectivity. Um, and so, in a way, the kind of celebration or the proliferation or like the experimentation or the uh, production of new types of subjectivity happens because we're in the ruin of that kind of Western male, blah, blah, blah. And I think that's maybe a way of thinking about the ruin as a, as a kind of space of possibilities or a kind of space where new forms emerge or new, new practices emerge. 
new types of subjectivity emerge. Uh, and I think one of the counter movements to that, which I think changes the kind of, I think, I think the age thing is quite important here. But I think one of the counter movements to that generation of subjectivities is the far right today. So the far right's claim is essentially, no, we're going we're gonna to burn everything now for ourselves. And also we refuse the notion that the traditional Western subject is no longer the centre. We refuse that that subject is in ruins and we reclaim it back again. And it seems to me broadly a description of like the current culture wars as well as economic paradigms for the right to, to win. So I think, I think the, the kind of technical subjectivity that I can see the, the kind of most productive or the kind of most generative form of the ruin as something that we would endorse. And actually contemporary has been very important in promoting, right? So the work of ruining that, that historically central subject, historically through colonialism as well as through patriarchy in the West, um, was the kind of postmodern arguments of Butler, feminism, and so on and so forth from about the 60s to about the 90s. And since then, people have been sort of like working and working that scene and sort of presenting new modes. And you know, we know there's lots of arguments and mm -hmm. contestations to be had. But this, in some ways, is a great space to, yeah. to, be, <laughs> to be generating. And it seems to me that space has happened because that traditional subject is ruined, right? So again, it's just an attempt to kind of say, like, come on, you know, something. <laughs> it's not just all bleakness in terms of ruination. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope it's not because I, I think that um, we actually uh, someone who has a strangely unpredictable figure as Bruno Latour wrote about that, that this uh, um, all right movement and, and this well, this actually proves that everybody accepts climate change by saying this is an acceptance through denial. Because the denial is so fierce and so destructive and so completely lacking any future orientation uh, that that this shows okay it's not it's not really debatable anymore you know this this is a fact right uh, of ruination and I think that that, that this refusal of it it shows that which doesn't make it easy to fight necessarily but uh, it shows that but it also which I think is what's we should remember in terms of thinking of the future, whether it's through these ruins or not, whether you like them or not, that's, that's fine, um, is that, that those political movements do not offer any vision of the future. None. None of them can even actually describe what kind of policies they want to implement. All they can say is, no, it's still okay to be wise and it's good and the West is the best and we'll come back, we'll go back to it. Right? I mean, Let's take the ridiculous figure of Donald Trump, who's, who's now going to run for the third time with the same slogan, Make America Great Again. It's the third time he's going to run with that slogan. Why didn't he make it great? Well, that's not the point. But the point is, <laughs> it's a retrospective claim, right? It's a claim of loss of retrospection. Make it great again. It's acknowledgement of the loss, but not that when, when how do we move on from that? Like, well, we have to go back to, but, you know, but it's absolutely senseless. And because it doesn't have, and I think we saw that, and we'll see that, we see that elsewhere uh, in Europe with some of those, those types of politicians, they don't actually go. <laughs> you know, they, don't, they don't really have any policies um, <coughs> except talking about a return. But it's very difficult to talk about a return when you have returned to power. So. All right, let's, let's end there. Um, thank you, Simon. <laughs>